Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white? Turn to 66. I think, of course, now you better be sure that you're washed in the blood because I don't think it's going to be long. 66. Years I spent in vanity and pride Caring not my Lord was crucified Brother Jay, if you don't mind the night, open us up in prayer, please, sir. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to see you. All, all a uh, bunch of you, whatever you are, <laughs> it's good to have you in the house of God. Amen. <clears throat> Let's start off where you got to start off. Have a tendency sometime to come to church and play like everything's all right. How many ever done that? Don't do that. 
just be honest, at least with yourself. You've got to be honest with yourself before you can get honest with God. Amen? Because you, whatever you say or do, now please don't misunderstand me. Don't come in and sometimes self-examination and introspection can turn into self-worship. So you've got to make sure you examine yourself through the eyes of God or through the Word of God. And when you examine yourself and get a clear understanding of how God sees you or see yourself through God's eyes, then it gives you a clear perspective as to what God desires of you and maybe wants to change or fulfill in your life. But here's the good news. Um, I'm more convinced today than I've ever been, as, as, and I've been, I've been convinced of this for a long time, but, folks, I need to tell you to make sure you got your heavenly bags packed. I am absolutely positive of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? When I mean imminent, I mean He could come right now. And I'm looking for Him right now. And if He doesn't come right now, I'll look for Him the next minute. Here's why. Even Paul, almost 2,000 years ago, constantly has his eye on the skies for Jesus to return. How much more should we? And some of the things that are happening around us, and we just think, oh, well, you know, things are getting bad, and they're going to get worse, or they're going to get better. They're going to get real better for the believer. We're going to have more. We're going to, I'm going to see people smile that really know Jesus that had never smiled before because all the sadness in this crazy world and the heartaches that's in this world. One day soon, I'm convinced we're going to be able to see Jesus on the way up. Amen. And by the way, uh, remember that old song, It'll Be Worth It After All? It will be. It will be. So keep your eyes on Him. We're looking at the time in John 19 when Jesus has already been tried by His peers, or if you will, the Jews' court been sentenced and sent over to Pilate's court. And Pilate has just examined him in chapter 19, verse 4, when he says, uh, I, made, I want you to know that I find no fault in him. He's doing his best to uh, deliver himself. Have you ever tried to walk in the middle or sit, or sit as the old saying goes, straddle the fence? How many know that's uncomfortable, especially if it's barbed wire? Well, I think that's what it is. And I, Pilate was trying to do that. He was trying to satisfy the Jews and also keep, uh, keep Herod appeased. And so, all of a sudden, he says, I don't find any fault in him, but uh, I'm going to bring him forth to you. Then in verse 5, where we'll start tonight, the Bible says, Then came Jesus forth, Wearing. I looked at that word wearing, and there should be a greater emphasis in some sense. And I was looking at the root word, and it really means that when it came out, it could be translated this way. Then came Jesus forth, bearing the burden of a crown of thorns and the purple robe. Bearing the burden. Not just wearing, as you might casually put on something. But it was a burden that God the Father had allowed before the time began that Jesus would bear as He made the procession from where He is now on to where He's ultimately been headed since He was born some 33 and a half years before that time. So He's coming now wearing that crown, that crown of thorns that we described to you last time with thorns up to at least at least according to what some of the authors say it could be at least 12 inches long the thorns which would be tremendous as far as the damage they could do and the purple robe which was a which was a mockery it's, it's in, actually was symbolic of of royalty and they were remember mocking jesus you know oh you're a king you're a king here wear this robe while we crucify you this is what we do to kings here that claim to be as high up as Herod. In verse 6, the Bible says, And when, I'm sorry, let me read all of verse 5, And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man, that exclamation, by the way, 
was making sure because, remember, he had been told that Jesus, and by the way, he's going to be tried for blasphemy. He claimed to be God. He didn't have to claim to be God. He was God. But his claim was, and when, they, when Pilate made the statement, Behold the man, it seems to me the emphasis is on the man, and Pilate just saw him as a, another man. Just another man. In verse 6, the Bible said, And when the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, You take him. Take you him and crucify him. You want him crucified? You crucify him. I find no fault in him. Again, Pilate had no legal reason under Roman law at this point to crucify him. Basically, they had this assumption because he claimed to be the Son of God and God the Son and God that Pilate didn't care who he claimed to be. In fact, at this point, he didn't really know that Jesus had made that claim. Listen as he continues. And, and by the way, that word crucify, I looked up, there seemed to be more to that word than just, you know, you seem to say the word crucify. That seems just de not descriptive enough, is it? Crucify. And it literally means to impale. To be impaled. That means literally hung by the inwards, if you would, upon the cross. And so he said, crucify him. I don't find any fault in him. And then the Bible says in verse 7, the Jews answered him and said, now we have a law. They're always good about coming up with laws that fit their occasion, don't you think? And by our law, he ought to die. And here's why. Because he made himself the Son of God. Now, by the way, he were actually using the law out of Leviticus 24, 16. And sometime if you want to go over and read Leviticus 24, 16, they do have a law. Blasphemy was worthy of death. And they considered the words that Christ said blasphemous. But when they said that, this is the first time that Pilate caught on to what the whole thing was about. He's, he claims to be the Son of God. And then verse 8 says, And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Now, why would he be afraid? Well, you see that term, Son of God, to him, here's what it meant. There, was, there were men who claimed to be the Son of God, and, and they had supernatural powers. They were, those men claimed to have supernatural powers. And Pilate was thinking, I do not want anything to do with this man. He might decide to do away with me. And so when he heard that he claimed to be the Son of God, then Pilate was extremely nervous. And in verse 9 it says, And went out again to the judgment hall, and said unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Where'd you come from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Now you think that that didn't incense Pilate? He didn't say a word. Remember Isaiah 53? He was led like a lamb to a slaughter, and he opened not his mouth. Christ could have said one word, and the whole world would have been destroyed. Much less those who were bringing him now. You talking about sovereignty under control? There it is. A God who could have breathed and the world disappeared allowed himself to stand quietly while he was being insulted, questioned by infidels, headed to a cross for one primary purpose to do the will of his father he had one singular thing in his mind to do the will of his father and to pay the sin debt for you and I and he said Pilate unto him in verse 10 speakest thou not unto me you're not going to talk to me I'm Pilate man that's the insinuation knowest thou not that I have power, and this is not the word dunamis, it's the Greek word exousia, which literally means I have the privilege, I have, I have been given the authority. He had exousia, Jesus had dunamis. The difference is exousia was a man-made privilege or 
or an office. And dunamis is a gift from God. This is where we get our word dynamite. Guess which one's the greater? Absolutely. So he said, I have power to crucify thee and have power to release you. I mean, I've got your life in my hands, buddy. I love, I believe Jesus answered something like this. Oh, thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, you need to understand that he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. You know what he did? He just walked right by Pilate and pointed to those. Could it could have been Judas that he could was referring to? Could have been Caiaphas, who was the, um, of course, the high priest who delivered him. But I read something that makes me think he was thinking about uh, something a little bit closer. Look at verse 6 again. And maybe this isn't what he was talking about. In verse 6 he says, When the chief priest, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him. And maybe these were the ones he was talking about. These have the greater sin. They delivered me unto you. The Jews would not allow me to be tried under Judaistic law. So the high priest and the officers, I don't need to use the term Jews lightly here because it was only a part of the Jews. Not all of them. And he says, they have the greater sin. And in verse 12, and from thence, thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Pilate says, you know, I, I want out of this thing. Have you ever gotten in something you just wished to goodness there was a way out? <laughs> And there's not, but well, this guy was looking for a way out of this thing as hard as he could, even though he was in, he just said, I'm totally in control. But all of a sudden, when Jesus said, buddy, let me remind you, you have no power at all unless God allowed you to do this. You just absolutely could do nothing. I think all of a sudden, Pilate decided to get a little bit religious. Maybe this guy is right. I just, I just want to get my hands. Remember, he did go out and wash his hands, symbolically saying, uh, you know, I don't find any fault in him. I'm not responsible for anything. Pilate, you were responsible from the day you breathed. So is every other human being. All it takes to be a sinner is breathe. Amen? Not just Pilate, but all of us. And Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, Thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king. Oh, that's the first time Pilate heard that too. Speaketh against Caesar. Now I can tell you the Jews detested Caesar. They had no, no uh, desire to see Caesar rise higher. They had no problem speaking against Caesar. They were using a political ally to get this man's attention to make sure Jesus died before the day was over, or actually the following day. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, it was like that's the last straw. He brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat. Now, when he sits down in the judgment seat, he's ready to pass sentence. This is judgment hall. He's the judge. Time for humanity to speak the death nail that God the Father allowed them to do to His Son. When you think about that, think about two things. This could not have been stopped by one million angels. It was foreordained by God the Father that His Son be sentenced to death. And His sentence was the one that we deserve. And as Pilate sat in that seat, he condemned us along with him. But he had no idea that we had to die with him so that we could really live. Did you get it? Humanity cannot live outside of the grace of God. Beautiful picture where he sat down in a place that is called the pavement. But in the Hebrew, it's called Gabbatha. I looked up the word and I found translations after translations that literally brought it down to something like the knoll. 
a little hill. In fact, it's called the skull. And what it is, is the way it looks. The place looks like. It's just a little knoll, but it's symbolic. It looks like a skull in shape. That's why it was called the skull. In verse 14, it says, And it was the preparation of the Passover. That means the day before, the night before Passover. And about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. (laughs) But they cried out, Wait a minute. They're the ones that said Jesus said that he was king. And now when Pilate comes back and he says, Okay, here's your king. Then all of a sudden they say, Oh, wait a minute. Listen to what they said. They said, Wait a minute. Away with him and crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? This guy is not letting go, is he? You know, this is a put down for Christ and really a slap in the face for the Jews. Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but who? My word, out of the mouth of people who absolutely decried any other king except God the Father. Now, in order to get their way, in order to have this man out of their way, only knowing they were doing the greatest service to you and I that could have ever happened. Don't turn him loose. Crucify him. Verse 16, the Bible said, Then delivered he him, therefore unto them, to be crucified. And they took Jesus, the Jews, and led him away. Now, also, of course, there was the army soldiers that helped escort Jesus to prepare now for the rest. Now, I want to go back to verse 14 because if you read, how many have ever read the other three Gospels and this Gospel? And there seemed to be, when it comes to the day of preparation, when it seemed to come to the Passover, there seems to be a little bit of differing about eating when the Passover meal was eaten. And uh, I read, I did some research and I liked this better than any of the things that I found. It made more sense to me and what I had thought. And I'm always excited to find anybody that agrees with what I think. So, we both, we both may be wrong, but let me read what uh, Dr. John MacArthur said. The chronological reckoning between John's Gospel and the Synoptic does present a challenge to the accounts of the Last Supper. When the Synoptics, that means Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they speak of the Synoptic Gospels, that simply means those three more or less agree in context and story realm and everything. John stands alone as differing in a sense. And so... Um, and they, they actually have a problem as the Last Supper, as eating the Passover meal on Thursday evening, which would have been Nisan the 14th, and Jesus being crucified on Friday. Uh, John's Gospel state that the Jews did not enter into the Praetorium or the ju- Judgment Hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So it seems to be a, a conflict when you see it. And so the disciples had eaten the Passover on Thursday evening, but the Jews had not. In fact, John 19, 14 states that Jesus' trial and crucifixion were on the day of preparation of the Passover and not after the eating of the Passover. This means that since the trial and the crucifixion occurred on Friday, Christ was actually sacrificed at the same time the Passover lambs were being slain. And that's absolutely correct. The question then becomes, why did disciples eat the Passover meal on Thursday? How many have ever read that and thought, wait a minute, I, 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 the two and you read them together and you realize, wait a minute, something's wrong. That has to do with when certain of the Jews saw the day ending and beginning. Okay? Here's what happens. There are two distinct ways that Jews in Jesus' day reckoned the beginning and the ending of days. Jews in the northern Palestine, which were all of these men, all the disciples, and Christ was born there except Judas. Judas was the one that wasn't. Um, They reckoned the beginning and the end of days. And Jews in the northern Palestine calculated days from sunrise to sunrise. At least one non-regional group, the Pharisees, used that system of timekeeping. But the Jews in southern Israel, which is centered in Jerusalem, that's where they are now, calculated the days from sunset to sunset. In contrast to the Pharisees, the priests, and the Sadducees, who for the most part lived around Jerusalem, followed the southern scheme. 
Now you understand why one part of them ate the Passover supper and yet the Passover was not beginning. So it's because of the time that they started reckoning the days in the beginning. In spite of the confusion, these two calendars must have been created at times um, and must have created in times in confusion in men's mind. They were kept for practical reason during the Passover season. For instance, it allowed for the feast to be celebrated legitimately in two adjoining days. So the double calendar easily explains the parrot contradiction in the gospel accounts. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. That helps. And if you, by the way, if anyone wants to read some of this, I'll be glad to share it with you. But it gives a better understanding and a comprehending that there is no contradiction in the Word of God. Anytime we see it, the contradiction may be in our mind, but it's never in the Word of God. It just takes a little searching and, and looking for. So maybe that'll help you the next time you get here and you realize they were taking the Passover supper. And yet those men that didn't go into the judgment hall because they wanted to take the Passover supper was after the Jews had already, uh, Jesus and his group had already taken the Passover supper. You understand what I said? Why it was easy to get confused? Did I confuse you more? I hope not. <laughs> okay. All right. Verse 17, and he, Jesus, bearing his cross. When it mentions the cross, it's the cross member, not the entire cross. It's just the member that stretches from one side to the other. I know there's a lot of discussion about what the cross looked like. And, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, you know, it, uh, I'm not going to get into the ambig ambiguity of that. But I know that one thing, there was a sign hung over Jesus' head. And the only way it could have been that kind, he could hang it over his head. It had to be a cross that allowed the total cross that we look at today, not the T cross. So according to what the Bible says. But anyway, the, the, they, he left bearing that cross piece, and he went forth to a place called of a skull, the place of the skull, which is in the Hebrew is called Golgotha. That's why we call it Golgotha, why it's called Calvary, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side and Jesus in the midst. Isn't it wonderful? He was probably had kings on each side, don't you guess? No, he had thieves on one on one side and one on the other. And of course, this was prophesied that this would happen as he hung there between those two thieves. Um, it's an amazing story, as you well know. If you get to the other Gospels, you find that one of the thieves said, Get us down from here. Sounds like a religious guy. Let me make a, let me make a deal with you. If you're who you say you are, get us down from here. And of course, the other one cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. You know, and he told the other guy, he said, in fact, one of the Gospels says both of them railed on him. And then one, though, spoke up and said, um, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And I love these words. And Jesus didn't say these words. I'm adding these parts. I'm going to do better than that. Today, you'll be in paradise with me. Don't you? Isn't that a wonderful promise? I got news for you. He told every one of you, the day you die, you're going to be in heaven with me immediately for to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and the minute that your spirit leaves your body here you won't even have time to think you'll be in his arms amen some there's so much question how many people have run into all kind of questions now about soul sleep and all these things well you know when you die you go here and you go there and it's a waiting place of the soul I'll tell you where the waiting place is in the arms of my loving Lord Jesus Christ and there ain't no waiting heaven's heaven's real and it's absolutely now according to the Bible and Pilate wrote these words now listen here you wrote a title and put it on the cross actually it's like more than one title but he wrote it in a sense of this way and the writing was this Jesus of Nazareth Oh, boy, the king of the Jews. Well, now you say, and they, the Jews are going to be infuriated. But wait a minute. They're the ones that came up with the idea that he was claiming to be a king so that he could be crucified for blasphemy. He could be crucified for, from the Jews' standpoint. He could be die. He could have to die from blasphemy. But from the Roman standpoint, he would die because of insurrection two charges both were ridiculous by the way if you ever think about someone said well you know I was talking about a guy who, who was an atheist or says claimed to be an atheist and he said well your God your God Jesus is Jesus guy died as a criminal I said no you got it wrong he died for criminals 
Amen. Aren't you glad? That includes us as sinners. But he's put it on his cross, and here's what it said. Jesus of Nazareth. That defined the Jesus. There were many Jesus, men named Jesus in that day. And this identified the Jesus that was nailed to the cross. And this title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh unto the city, the place of the skull. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and what? Latin. Simply covered all of those who would go in and out of the city would be able to read this. And then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but just say it this way, Pilate. Say that he said, I am king of the Jews. I love Pilate's answer. No, what I have written, I have written. It ain't going to change. You know, I'm, I'm amazed at people that think through their finagling, they can cause something to happen to be in control. And God takes the upper hand and just kind of reminds them, you chose this man to be over my son. Now I'm going to put this man over you and put you in your place. What I've written, I have written. It's done. Verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Christ, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Remember this was prophesied of what would happen to his tunic. This was the tunic actually worn up near the body. They, they usually the first part of the clothing on the body. It's not necessarily what we'd consider an, an external garment like a coat as they call it here. Then said they for, therefore themselves, I'm sorry, then said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Isn't it amazing? God had control. There's another, there's another fulfillment of prophecy, that they would cast lots. You know what cast lots are? It's about like shooting dice. It's just whatever number comes up, but what's my number? I got it. And it wasn't dice, but it was lots, as they called it at that time. And they said, they, we will cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the Scripture might be fulfilled which said they parted my raiment among them and for my vesture they did cast lots these things therefore the soldiers did you know it's amazing God's word is always fulfilled exactly exactly as God said it would be now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother so far from the time they began to drive the nails through his wrist, not in his palm of his hands, through his wrist, so it would hold him there. Through his hand, through his hands, the nails would have ripped out quickly. Through here, can't rip out. Or it could have had, he could have spoken, it could happen, but physically that was the way it was done. And so far there's been no utterance from Christ that we have recorded in this particular gospel. And then the Bible says, but there was with him his mother and his mother's sister, sister, which was probably Salome. Not sure of that, but it appears that it could have been. And then there was Mary, the wife of Cleophas, which was the father of James the Less. And then Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, when she got saved, she got it, didn't she? Demons were cast out of this I, You know what? Dear God, we need some of that kind of salvation today. For nothing, that, by the way, she got the same thing we got. We just didn't follow through like she did. Amen. Everywhere Jesus showed up, there she is. No matter what the consequences were, no matter what, the, what was said about her and what was said about him. And I, I, I get, when I get here, I get a little bit, let me stop just a minute before I, I don't want my flesh to get involved in this, but the, the movie that was so blasphemous that pictured Mary Magdalene and Jesus as being in a, in a, in a sexual affair. I, I just, uh, it's amazing to me God don't kill people. Let me tell you something, it's dangerous to mess with God's Word. And I had a guy tell me today, he said, I went to see that movie Noah, and he said, I have never seen such a mess in my life called Bible picture movie. And I said, what do you expect out of Hollywood, buddy? Now, thank God there are some 
there are some that uh, appear at least the only one I've seen so far is the Passion of the Christ and uh, you can bet that that Hollywood is going to take as as much license as they need to sell the movie because it's about the bottom line in most cases but anyway uh, I wouldn't someone said well I'll just go to see what they have to say let me tell you the danger of what you put in your mind can't come out be careful little children what you see what you hear what you do anyway I'm not telling you what to do but I'm coming pretty close I think uh, so in verse 26 we're going to hear the first words mentioned here in John from the cross when Jesus therefore saw his mother think about this he's hanging there near the time that his last earthly breath should be taught, taken he looked out and there was John and his mother and the disciple is John standing by whom he loved that's the disciple whom he loved John's always lists himself that way he never puts his name there always speaking of the disciple Jesus loved and he said unto his mother woman which was by the way a very respectful title this was not speaking down it was it was a title of endearment and a, and a and it's like saying this precious lady behold thy son he pointed to John literally saying mom mother mom mother whatever you want to call I'm going to leave you in John's care I want to make sure you're taken care of and then he said to disciple John the whole your mother thy mother mother treat John like your son John treat my mother like your mother to me that's so tender the care that he had and the agony that he was in the presence of mind to be concerned by the way to me this is significant as it led into the real if you will closing of the curtain when he did one of the most graceful things and most wondrous things that he did when he looked at those who had nailed him to the cross and lifted his eye to heaven here's grace folks and he said father forgive them for they know not what they do I don't believe he was speaking just to them I think he was speaking to all of us but the emphasis was those who nailed him, those who beat him. You see, the one thing that we need to garner from this is there's no such thing as stopping grace. You can't stop it. It runs over governments. It runs over torture. It will stomp all things to get to the recipients. Nothing could stop God's grace from reaching me and you and you and you and you and it had to go through the cross to get to us isn't that precious hallelujah I'm telling you what almost makes me want to have a running fit think about the goodness of God sometimes and what he suffered for people like me and you and you know please don't you love him but, but wait a minute how much Um, with all your heart, soul, body, mind. Oh, you know what that means, don't you? We love Him with our life. Our life is our proof of love for Jesus. Remember, Jesus said it this way, if you love me, keep my words. And by the way, if you don't keep my words, you don't love me. Somebody say amen. I just turned it around. But that's exactly what it means. And I think we take the love of God for granted. And you know, if there's anything, anything near blasphemy to me, that sounds pretty close to take God's love for granted at the price that he paid so and at that hour the disciple took her into his own home we're going to stop there next Sunday the Lord willing will be what we call Palm Sunday when Jesus actually rode in on a little donkey 
And the people recognized who he was and began to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save me now or save now. And uh, I want you to think about this as you study through the, the rest of John, is, is especially up to, go through the resurrection anyway, chapter 20. Go through that. Because this is a time that we're celebrating, that we're coming up on. And uh, we, we call it, I call it, Resurrection Sunday. And don't forget, the kids will be having a egg hunt here on the 19th. Is that correct? Okay. That's on Saturday before, before uh, Resurrection Sunday. So come and bring your children and, and let them see a practice of celebrating the gospel even with something as simple as an egg. I believe we ought to use every instrument we have to let people know about this wonderful man named Jesus. Amen.